Uh, this evening, we're going to really look at uh, one particular verse, and as I've said, this is somewhat topical, so we're not going to break this verse down necessarily. We're just going to see one part of the, of the picture in this verse, but let me read uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 31, and what I want us to see, at least the climax of this, is in verse uh, 31. Acts chapter 4, beginning in uh, verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed." When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. May the Lord bless his word again to our understanding this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we saw that when uh, God originally made us in his image, we shared in certain of his characteristics so that we could fellowship with him. 
characteristics we saw that can be divided into two different categories, uh, what we call God's natural image and God's moral image. Uh, when God made us, he gave us an intelligent soul so that we could think about him, so we could understand him and what it is that he wanted us to do. He gave us a will. He gave us purpose so that we could do things and carry out his will. Uh, he made us moral beings uh, originally so that we might want to do uh, what it is that uh, he calls us to do, but uh, a moral capacity to know the difference between good and evil. And of course, he made us uh, immortal so that we might live forever uh, with him. Now, again, this is what we call God's natural image. But we also saw that when he breathed the breath of life into uh, that first man that he made, into our bodies, we might say, in Adam, he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we would be sanctified, so that we would love what he loves, uh, the things that are good, the things that are right. And in loving these things, we would also hate everything contrary to that, uh, everything that isn't good and isn't right. Now, we call that God's moral image. Now, that's what we lost in the fall. We lost the moral image of God. We lost the Holy Spirit, and so our likeness to God in that way. We saw that's why Adam and Eve felt naked. They lost the very thing that made them most like God. They lost their moral purity. They lost their desire for Him and His ways. They became guilty and corrupt and so came under his judgment. Now, the Bible says that when we come into this world, we still bear God's natural image. We can still think, we can still desire, we can still uh, do things, and we will live forever. But we no longer share that love for the good that God has because we don't have his Holy Spirit. So, we, when we come into this world, use our minds to try to hide the things that God reveals. We try to tear down the knowledge of God. We do the things that He hates because those are the things now that we want. And because of this, if it were not for God's grace, we would have lived forever under His wrath in hell. Now, we know that that's exactly the problem that Jesus came to fix. He came to bring the Spirit's presence back into our souls so that we might be restored to fellowship with God. Now, this evening, I want us to consider what the Spirit does in bringing us to Jesus, what He does to empower us to serve Him, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, how we might gain more of that help, more of that power. So first of all, let's consider his work in bringing us to Jesus, that restoration of the Holy Spirit that's necessary before we will trust in the Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus said to Nicodemus on one occasion, again, that very famous conversation that we find in John chapter 3, in verse 3, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is what the discussion that Nicodemus had uh, with Jesus was all about, at least what Nicodemus was after. Jesus cuts, as it were, to the chase, and he tells them exactly what he needed to hear, and that is the kingdom was present. It was present because the king was present, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Nicodemus couldn't see it because he didn't have what Jesus was telling him about. He didn't have this new birth. He wasn't born again. Now, Jesus expands on this a bit further in verses 5 and 6, telling Nicodemus and us, basically, that we, cannot, not, we not only cannot see the kingdom of heaven without this rebirth, but we cannot enter into the kingdom unless we are born again by the Holy Spirit. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, there is a bit of debate here as to what Jesus means when he says that one must be born of the water. You know, we're going to come back to the spirit in just a moment. Now, some believe that he's referring to water baptism. And that, of course, would fit in very well with, with Rome's idea, or I should say the Roman Catholic view of baptism giving us initial grace. They believe that you need to be baptized to receive the grace of God, and if you are at least baptized, you will eventually make it into heaven. And of course, Lutherans, uh, Lutherans also have a view tied to this of the Lord's giving uh, the gift of faith at baptism. So they see this being born of the water as being baptized. Of course, the problem with that is the Bible doesn't really teach either of these things. Uh, it teaches us that baptism does not convey grace. It doesn't give us the new birth. It's really a symbol of the new birth. He tells us that we should believe and repent and then be baptized. Water baptism in and of itself cannot help us see or enter God's kingdom. So Jesus really can't mean that. Others believe that Jesus was referring to the law of God, that he's using water here as a symbol for the word of God, which must first do its work in our hearts before the Spirit brings the new birth. In other words, you have to have that conviction of the law, and then the work of the Spirit comes. Now, we do believe that the Lord saves through the gospel, that he uses the law to convict us of our sins, he holds out the promise to us of forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ if we will only repent and believe. That is the way that the Lord actually saves. Paul writes in Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Spirit makes the gospel powerful to save. So this, this could be uh, the right view. It's also possible he could be referring to natural birth, that you have to be born the first time before you can be born the second time. In essence, what he's saying is the first birth is not enough. It's not enough, Nicodemus, that you're a Jew, that you're a natural child of Abraham. You also need to be born from above by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you're just simply Abraham's natural offspring, that isn't enough, and, and certainly that's possible. But still another view is that Jesus is referring to a passage in Ezekiel where the Lord promises in the new covenant that he is going to sprinkle water, the water of cleansing upon his people to cleanse them from their sins, which is a picture of the Spirit's work of applying Jesus to us and washing away our sins. And then he says he will give them a new heart and a new spirit which was essentially an Old Testament picture of the new birth. You see, Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about this very thing. And Nicodemus, being the teacher of Israel, uh, should have known what that meant. So Jesus is basically telling him something he should have already known. And I think this is the right view. We have to be born uh, by the application of Jesus to us, and the Holy Spirit's working within us this new uh, heart. Now, the important thing I want us to see here, though, is essentially we need that new birth. He says in verse 5, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Spirit is the one who actually brings about both of these things. He's the one who applies Jesus. He's the one who changes the heart. The Spirit has to do this work, Jesus says, before we can see the kingdom of heaven in Jesus and enter into that kingdom through Jesus. Remember, he is the door, and we won't see him as the door unless the Spirit does his work. Now, let me just tie that to what we saw this morning. Remember, we lost the Spirit in the fall, and we became blinded to the kingdom of heaven in the Lord Jesus Christ because we no longer had the love for the things that were good and right, which means we no longer loved God, we no longer loved His Son, and we would want nothing to do with the gospel because our love for these things, 
our desire for these things, our seeing them as something desirable, was actually taken away when we lost the Holy Spirit. So our response would be what Jesus said it would be to those who are without Christ or without the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. He says, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Jesus here is describing those, this is the way we come into the world. Those who don't have the Spirit of God see the light as something undesirable, and they will not come to him. They will not come to the light in our Lord Jesus. Now again, this was our condition. This is how we would have remained if it wasn't for God's mercy in sending us his Son to give us the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So what is it that the Spirit does in the new birth to change these things? Well, very simply, he restores what was lost in the fall. He restores that love for what is good and right. He restores that love for the light. Now, he does that by joining himself to our souls, working that grace in us, basically he comes back into our lives in the same way that he was in the lives of Adam and Eve, uh, not necessarily at the beginning because they were, I believe, perfectly sanctified at the beginning, but in that state that they found themselves after the Lord had redeemed them. And the Spirit of God does that when he unites us to the Lord Jesus Christ. He unites himself to our souls and he becomes an active principle of love in our souls. Now, the Lord represents this to Nicodemus as a new birth, a spiritual rebirth, uh, as we've already seen. But in the scripture, he also represents it as the giving of new faculties, faculties that we didn't have before, as the opening of blind eyes, as the unstopping of deaf ears. You know, Jesus often performed these particular miracles of giving sight to the blind, giving hearing to the deaf, not just to show that he was, in fact, the promised Messiah, but to show what he had come to do in our lives spiritually. I believe that's what our, our Lord is telling us in Isaiah 35. It's a brief chapter. I'd like to read it for you. It's, it's spoken of in terms of physical terms, making a wilderness beautiful, um, healing people physically. But it's actually referring to the spiritual blessings that Messiah was to bring when he came and did his, his work. This is what we read beginning in verse 1. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Araba, which is the southern desert region of Palestine, will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Araba. The scorched land will become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy 
and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Again, speaking in physical terms of the spiritual blessings that Jesus would bring, and what he would bring would be the opening of blind eyes, the unstopping of deaf ears, among other things. Now, he also speaks of these, this rebirth as the giving of a new heart. And here is the passage I referred to earlier in Ezekiel, which I think Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about in John 3, in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 and 26. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So here it's represented as the taking out of the heart of stone and giving a heart that is, that is not fleshly in the sense of sinful, of course, but in, in a sense that it's, it, it moves with compassion. It, it beats for the Lord. Now, this is exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to cleanse us from our sins and to give us new affections, new desires. Now, when the Spirit opens our eyes and when He opens our ears, when He gives us this, this new heart, when He restores this love which we lost in the fall, it, it does several things. It makes us, first of all, see Jesus in a way that we had not seen Him before. We don't really see... Uh, really learn anything new about him, but what we know about him we see in a different light. We begin to appreciate it. What we hated about him before, that light that we talked about earlier, the light of his truth and holiness, we begin to see as something beautiful. That's actually what it is. It is beautiful. We saw it in the way we saw it before because our hearts were, were evil, but now we see it for what it really is, and that is beautiful. It, it makes us, this new birth makes us see the Bible differently. Before we didn't want to read the Bible, maybe we saw it as any other book, or maybe we saw it as something worse, as something we didn't want to read. We didn't want to listen to it, but now we want to listen to it. Now we see the beauty and the glory of the Lord in it. We hear Him speaking to us through it, and we want to listen to Him. Uh, we didn't used to believe what we read. It didn't seem real. It seemed like, like some kind of fantasy or a fable maybe or a legend, something that somebody made up. But the Spirit of God allows us now to see it for what it really is. And that is real. As a matter of fact, more real and more lasting than the things that we can see with our physical eyes. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see the reality and the beauty of these things. Now, we go through similar changes with regard to how we view one another as Christians. Before, perhaps, we used to avoid Christians, but now we want to spend time with them because we see that same beauty coming from one another that we see in Christ, that we see in the Word. Maybe we didn't want to come to the worship service, but now we actually look forward to going to it. You know, uh, Sinclair Ferguson uh, this past Wednesday had, a, I thought, a pretty good illustration of this very thing when he was talking about how a session was interviewing a young man for membership and the young man, was, as he was giving his testimony, said, you know, when I first started coming to this church, he goes, the, the sermons seemed so dull, seemed so boring and, and long. Uh, the prayers seemed like they were overly long and uh, the, the hymns we were singing didn't seem like they were that pleasant to sing, but he says something's changed. What if you, you're doing something different now? The sermons now are much more interesting, the prayers are too short, and the hymns are all, are all wonderful to sing. And the point he was making was that nothing really changed in the service. The preacher was still preaching the same way, still the same length of prayers and singing the same hymns, but his disposition towards them changed, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's really all we needed was a change of heart. And that's what the Spirit gives us in the new birth. You know, the only difference, again, between a believer and an unbeliever is this work of the Holy Spirit putting this love for these things in our hearts. If we have that, Jonathan Edwards pointed out, if we have that, we have everything. If we have that, our lives are going to go the right direction. If we have that, we are going to become more like Jesus. 
Now, but now the Spirit of God not only brings us to Jesus, He also empowers us. All He needed to do to bring us to Jesus was to create this change in our hearts to make us to love Him, and everything else followed. All He needs to do now to give us the power that we need to move forward in serving Him in His kingdom is to strengthen the same love that He gave to us in that new birth, to turn up the heat, as it were, of our affections. You know, when the disciples followed Jesus, they followed Him because they already had something of the Spirit's work in their hearts. They, they wanted to follow Him. Their eyes were open. Their ears were open. Their hearts had been changed. They knew who Jesus was, and they loved what they saw. But notice, when it came time to stand with Jesus during the time of his, of his trial, of His betrayal and so forth, none of them stood with Him. They all fell away. Peter, who was the first one to say, even though everybody else will fall away from you, Jesus, I will never deny you, he had the opportunity to follow through on that promise and to stick with Jesus. But of course, if he did, that meant he would likely have to die with him. So Peter denies three times that he even knew him. And after the crucifixion, all the disciples went into hiding because they were afraid they might be arrested and put to death for having followed Jesus. I want you to notice they had the Spirit of God, they had this love for Jesus, but it didn't give them the power they needed to stand with Him. But notice the change at Pentecost when Jesus poured out His Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter, who stood up and preached before thousands of Jews, the one who before had denied Him, was now willing to proclaim Jesus publicly. And he preached such a convicting sermon that 3,000 people were converted. Of course, Jesus preached convicting sermons as well. People weren't converted, but it had to do with the Spirit of God on Jesus as well as the Spirit working among them. But look at the difference in Peter. Look at the difference in Peter and John when they stood before the Sanhedrin and they said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you or to God, you be the judge. We're just going to keep on teaching and preaching Jesus Christ and we don't care what you really have to say about it. The disciples who had all fallen away from Jesus began boldly to confess Him, again, even before the religious leaders who could have killed them as they did Jesus. Now we ask the question, what happened? The Spirit of God was poured out. They were strengthened. They were stronger. They had power. Where did that power come from? It came from the Spirit, but it came from the love that the Spirit of God gave them. The Spirit strengthened that love to the point where they were consumed with it. Remember how our Lord Jesus Christ, when He cleanses the temple, He said, this was to fulfill the Scripture, zeal for your house has consumed me. Why did Jesus do that? It's because He loved the Father so much and wanted to see Him honored, and He saw Him so dishonored by what they were doing in the temple that Jesus went in and He ran them all out. He cleansed them out. It's because He loved His Father. The Spirit strengthened their love for Jesus to the point where they had to honor Jesus. They had to tell other people about Him, no matter what the cost would be. Even if you're going to put me to death, I'm still going to do it. Now, John the Baptist said earlier when he was contrasting his ministry with that of Jesus in Matthew 3, verse 11, he says this, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I believe that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. This particular baptism of the Holy Spirit is likened to fire, like a holy fire in the soul that consumes you with a desire to honor Jesus no matter what. Now, this is the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have for Him. And it's really the only kind of love that can answer to the love that He has shown us. So the last question we need to ask is, how can we experience this power? How can we have more of this love? Well, we already know the Spirit of God is the only one who can give it to us. He is the author of this work. He is the creator of this love, 
in our souls. If we do not have him in our hearts, we really don't have anything of this love. We're still blind to the beauty of Christ that draws out that love. We're still deaf to his word because we still have hearts of stone. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, this is really what you need. This is where you need to begin. You need to come to Jesus and ask him for his Spirit to give you the new birth, to give you that love which gives you faith, the faith you need to trust in Jesus, and of course to give you the ability to walk with him. But as we've already noted, even if we already have him, and we have some of this love in our hearts. If it's not bringing us to the point where we can do what, what these folks did, what these disciples did, if it's not moving us to reach out to the lost, the love that we have is really not yet strong enough. We need, we need more. Like everything else that we experience in life, love, this love that the Spirit of God gives can ebb and flow. It can be stronger and it can be weaker. We already noted that even after the disciples were baptized with the Spirit of Pentecost, there were times when they needed more. And so they asked for it and they received it. Now we read again in, in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, let me just suggest that we are where, where they were we have the Spirit of God in our souls if we're trusting Jesus. We just need more power. So what do we do? We need to, to pray. Now, we are commanded, as I read in the meditation this morning, we are, or this evening, we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be under His influence, to be under His control, and nothing else, to have an undivided, singular heart that belongs to the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But how do we become filled with the Spirit? It's not something that comes with, with salvation. We can be saved and not filled with the Spirit, which is why Paul is commanding us, be filled with the Spirit. So how can we be filled? Well, let me suggest a couple of things. The first one is the most obvious, maybe the second most obvious. We need to use the ways the Lord has given to us to get more of His Holy Spirit. We need to read His Word. We need to worship. We need to fellowship with God's people. But secondly, above all, we need to pray. Now, there's a couple things we need to note here about the prayer of these disciples. When, when they prayed, when they asked for this help, Jesus gave them this help. But they ask for this help in a particular context, and maybe sometimes we don't note the context. It teaches us that we need to do more than just simply ask. We need to ask for the right reasons. We need to ask with the right motives. We need to ask for his help because we need his help actually to do what the Lord calls us to do. Note what the disciples were asking for. I mean, what was the reason they were asking for this? It's because they said, Lord, Look at the threats with which they're threatening us. Give us the boldness to reach out even though that's taking place. The disciples wanted to do this work. They wanted to do it because they had the Spirit working in their hearts. They wanted to do what Jesus had called them to do. But when it became clear that they were going to face this kind of opposition from the spiritual leaders of Israel, they had to ask for more. Give us boldness, even in the face of these threats, so that we can continue to preach your gospel. And the Lord gave it to them. Now, I think what this teaches us is that we really can't expect to receive this power, this help from the Holy Spirit, if we're not willing to do anything with it. I mean, that's often what we, we I think we tend to do, is we ask for the help and... You know, if we receive the help, we don't, 
we don't take it and do anything with it. We need to already have the purpose in mind to reach out and then ask for the help in order to do that. In other words, we need to set our hearts on carrying out the commission that Jesus gave to us, the Great Commission. If that's what we want to do, the Lord will help us to do that. He will give to us real help from His Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think we're not actually going to find that help until we begin you know, moving in that direction, until we step out, as it were, in faith and begin to be a witness of our Lord Jesus. Now, if we find that that's not what we really want to do, that we really don't want to reach out to the lost, and so we're not going to ask for the Spirit's help, well, then we need to begin by asking that the Lord would give us that desire to reach out to the lost by His Holy Spirit. Again, remembering what an honor and privilege it is and what a blessing it is when you actually do it, when you're sharing the gospel with someone, I think you will not sense the Spirit of God any more powerfully than you will at that particular moment. And perhaps even the worse, you know, the worse the circumstances are, perhaps the more powerfully you will sense Him. But you won't sense that help if you're not actively trying to reach out to other people. We need the Spirit of God, but we need the Spirit of God for a particular purpose, and that is to do what the Lord has called us to do. The more of His influence that we have, the stronger our love is going to be, and the stronger our love is, the more we will do for Him. So we need to remember two things. Ask for the Spirit. Ask for His help. But ask for a particular reason, that you might do what the Lord has called you to do. Uh, that help is there. The Lord promises to give it to us here. We see many examples of it, not only in Scripture, but in history, when the Lord has strengthened His people to do the work He has called them to do. That same help is available to us today. Jesus promises it to us. We just simply need to look to Him, have that desire, and then look to Him for the strength, and He will strengthen us. So may the Lord give us uh, the grace to be able to do that. Let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's pray that the Lord would, would help us to desire to do these things so that we would desire the help of the Spirit for the right reasons.